The dynamic planet in which we live is actually moving, but it's moving very, very slowly. And this plate tectonic process that brings continents together and pulls them apart creates a very, very famous cycle known as the Wilson cycle. Now that happens over millions and millions of years. And it starts actually when you start to pull continents apart, you get a rifting phase. This creates sedimentary basins. It eventually thins the crust to the point where you actually bring the mantle to the surface. And then we get to the stage where we actually start to form an ocean. And in many ways, that's happening today in the Atlantic, where we form the North Atlantic with Europe and America splitting apart. But after a while, the ocean gets bigger and bigger and then it starts to close in on itself. And that's the third phase, this ocean subduction and death of that ocean to the final collision point. And when you have a continent on one side and a continent on the other, they get brought together by this subduction. And when that happens, you have the mountain building phase of the Wilson cycle. And that in itself brings big continents crushed together and brings all the rocks back for us to, to look at and see. And really, that was the main bit of the Wilson cycle that was originally thought up. But it wasn't the final bit of, this, of the story. We actually have the fact that when you put mountains together and you crush them, they're quite unstable and they start to collapse. And it's that orogenic collapse, which is really the final stage in the understanding of the Wilson cycle, where we go from rifting drifting, subduction, collision, and collapse. And that is known as the Wilson cycle. We are on a geological field trip across southern Norway to explore how the rocks preserved along Norway's famous shorelines and in its beautiful mountains hold a detailed record of the mountain building process known as the Wilson cycle. We're gonna go across the south Scandinavian Caledonites from the Oslo area to the west coast and we're going to do it in, in two transects, one in a northern transect across and then like this and then in, um, in, um, in a different route going back to Oslo. Right. Uh, and during that time we will have the opportunity to look at the basement rocks that was originally part of Baltica. We will have a chance to look at the rifted uh, units that formed by the continental breakup and rifting of, of, of uh, Rodinia in yep. the late uh, Proterozoic. We will have a chance to look at uh, Ophiolite and Island Arc systems here in the west that formed in the Iapetus Ocean that was produced by the rifting. And then, of course, when the collision happened, we will see, we will see the nap structure and, and the various tectonic units that was related to the collision. Mm. So, I mean, from, from my perspective, it looks all quite chaotic, but, I mean, do, do you think you can get a lot of information from, I mean, do you have to really dig deep or is it quite well organised? We, you always have to ha dig deep. Yes. But uh, even if it's well organised. But uh, it is well organised in the sense that you have the, the, lower, the lower units, the ones that are sitting on top of the basement here, are the rift-related uh, right. units. The higher you get, the more exotic the rocks become. So right up yeah. here in Norland, when you go north of where we can visit today, you have remnants of the Laurentia, which was the continent that once collided with uh, Baltica and produced this big orogenic belt. So it's well organized, but it uh, has a lot of complications in detail. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of yeah. arranged a bit like the layers of a book, but yeah. it's, uh, you would say it's a, very, it, it's a very deep novel. It's a very deep novel, yeah. yeah. We are going back through time, unraveling the pages of this complex Wilson cycle book preserved in the rocks of Norway, back to the very start of the process. Uh, the first phase is the rifting phase. This is uh, the, the, the breaking up of a continent and the rifting, or creating of rifted margins. Our first stops are to look for evidence of these sediments with Hans Jürgen, a researcher at the University of Oslo. So in order to create mountains in the Wilson cycle, you actually first have to rift the continent apart and make a big ocean in between uh, the two continents. 
Yeah, so this is pretty cool. Okay. So oh, here wow, that's this little mess stuff, yeah. Yeah, so here you have flame structures. And if you actually look here, you can see that you have a really nice grading of the rocks going from relatively coarse grain down here, and then it becomes finer and finer and finer and finer, and all in here we have more or less mud and silt. Right, yeah, um, yeah. So this actually suggests that this has been deposited by a flow down into the deep basin. Okay. Um, so first you just deposit So now this is all actually, it's, been, it's starting to be deformed, so it's up on yep. its side, so we're sort of looking at it. But yep. So that's the stuff that comes in first, and then yep. it gets finer and finer. Exactly. And then you get another... And then you have another one here, yes. Coarse to fine. Yep. So what are these flame structures? What causes those? So they're basically loading structures. So when you dump new sediments on top of these um, sediments here that wasn't lithified yet, yep. um, you sort of start to, this will sink into this one. And so then it's like you a get soft these, sediment deformation. It's a soft thing. sediment deformation, yeah, wow. yeah. yeah. So these are sort of, rock, these are like turbidites. So these are turbidites, yes. Big event deposits that drop in quickly. And yeah. the, the soft sediment deformation is, is, a, is a function of that sudden loading. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So you, this means that we actually have a, quite some depth in the, in the basin already, and yeah. some water depth. Right. Yeah, and you're filling it in with these uh, yeah, immature sediments. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. And even here, you can also see a next one coming in. And here we have the, oh, these, these loading yeah, structures. Look at these. Yeah. Even the, the mud is almost squirting back up into the uh, yeah into the the, the the overlying sediment. So that that yeah. would have been sort of deposited yes. like that, and it's now yeah. starting to be deformed. So we're starting yeah. to move into the mountain range. Yeah. 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 Wow. These turbidites are not the only sediments filling the rift basins at this early stage of extension. Check this out, Dougal. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, look at this stuff. This is pretty cool. So now we're on top of uh, the turbidite sequence below us. And uh, here, basically, the, you have a shallowing on the basin. And uh, we're starting... Is this, this limestone, is it? Yeah, yeah, oh, exactly. Right. These are limestones. So we're starting to deposit uh, limestone. Um, nicely layered limestone. It's not it like, used to be nice. It's not like yeah. any limestone I've seen. No, no, it's really, really messed up, if I can say that. I mean, um, and the cause of this, this being so disrupted is still debated. We don't really know. But um, some sort of catastrophic things happened here to, to mess stuff up. Yeah, so there have been talk of tsunamis and um, uh, or big storms. So do you find packages of this sort of all, all interbedded, but then messed up and then fine again, and then messed up? Oh, exactly. wow. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I guess the, the origin of this limestone would have been when, when the things, are, you know, the water's quite calm and you yeah. start to precipitate and, and, yeah. and form limestone. But then there's been these events. Yeah, calm, clear water, no classic input. Uh, and you pass the limestone and then, boom, you get these events that mm. messes the whole thing up. I guess it's telling us that this whole sort of onset of rifting, the start of the Wilson cycle, mm. it's not just very passive. There's no. lots of things going yeah. on. Yeah. Wow. It's really, yeah, it's, it's a dynamic setting and, and there's lots of movement in the, in the bedrock below us. Uh, it might have big earthquakes, um, mm. even volcanoes. I mean, there are, uh, <laughs> there are some places. It looks like a broken set of matches. I mean, look at this lot. They're yeah. stacked up on each other. The next locality provides a really strange but key rock type in the story. Kind of nice when it's weather like this, isn't it? It is. It's always like this in Norway. <laughs> so what we got here then? Yeah, so this is a very interesting rock. Um, this is something you actually find all over the world. Um, and what's really interesting about it is that just below this we find um, carbonates that are usually deposited in very warm warm, warm water yeah um, like Bahamas type you know um, but this rock here is actually something called a tillite and this is has been deposited uh, basically by a glacier right a sort of cold so it's suddenly gone from warm to cold yeah yeah in presumably a very short amount of time sometimes you even found find the uh, depositional contact between this tillite and uh, and the carbonates below. Mm. So what, when you say a tillite, this, this thing has been interpreted as being something to do with ice. What's the yes. evidence for that? So um, a lot of places you can find um, glacial striations on the clasts, for instance. So the, these clasts basically show evidence for being ripped loose and then transported by ice. So scraped along scraped by the ice. Scraped along, yeah, 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 at the bottom of the, of the ice sheet. Uh, and often you can also find, at the depositional contact, you can also find these um, 
and these scourings mm. of, uh, from the glacier. And also like, there's a big block of granite there yeah. lying in a sort of fine matrix. I mean, yeah. is that significant as well? Absolutely. So, so, you know, as I said below here, you have sediments. You have um, probably several hundred meters of, um, of sedimentary rocks. And then all of a sudden you get these granites, big, big granites and big, uh, nice uh, glass Boulders, yeah. in here. Some of them are actually one and a half meters in diameter. Oh, wow. So, I mean, there are, you, need some, you need something to lift those and transport them. And then it's all been basically just dropped here. I mean, there's, if you look at closely here, you see no like uh, bedding Sedimentary or anything. structures, yeah. yeah. It's just one So could this sort of thing be be taken along on an iceberg and then as that melted, it gets dropped into the sediment? Sure, it could, yeah, but uh, but right here where you don't have any of these uh, these uh, this bedding, uh, it's more likely that it's been actually transported by a, a glacier and just dumped there by the glacier. Right. Okay. So usually when you okay. have the drop stones, then you also see a fine lamination. Right. Right. Uh, as well. So I guess the other important fact is that this type of rock, it's very difficult to interpret, but they find it around this time, what, about 600 million years or so? Yes, yes. All over the world? Yeah. So actually, actually for this exact uh, rock, it's a bit controversial. Right. Some people would say it's, um, it's about 580, it belongs to the Gaskiers glaciation, whereas others would argue that this is 637 or something, uh, which then would correlate with the Marinoan glaciation, which are two very big glaciations, but the Gaskiers are thought to be more of a local high altitude right. glaciation, whereas the Marinoan is actually... Well, that's linked the, to uh, the Snowball Earth yes, theory, isn't it? So the, the idea that the Earth was almost completely uh, exactly. uh, ice covered. So yeah. Yeah. that's incredible. When we look at the sediments that fill in the first phase of the Wilson cycle, it's quite a range. We see everything from deep water turbidites. So clearly we've created a very deep uh, basin. We're filling that in with deep water sediments. And then we get shallower water, warm limestones that are being produced. But then the climate actually changes quite dramatically. And we see this strange rock called a tillite. It's a, a diamictite. It's a, it's a weird rock that's been made by glaciers. And what's really interesting is actually around this time of just over 600 million years ago, all around the planet Earth, we see this same style of rock, rocks deposited by glaciers, which suggests that there was a really big cooling event, sometimes called Snowball Earth, that happened around this time. Amazing valley, this whole sort of place. Yeah, it? it is. It's really nice with the river and everything. So maybe you can show us whereabouts we've been going. Yeah. Sure. Unfold this thing. There you go. Yeah, so we started here in Oslo. And then we've been going through some basement and then into this, um, into the basement here. And then went into the naps up here in Hamad and then Brumendal. And then we went to Muelv. Okay. And we looked at the tillites. And then we went over here to this BD formation, which is the carbonate. And then now we've been driving past Lillehammer or Lillehammer. And then up along this, um, this road here where we're into this turbidites. So all of these sediments is the, the sort of, first evidence of, the, of the, the rifting in the Wilson cycle. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So here's a stratigraphic section, basically, of what we've been uh, looking at with these turbidite sections down here. Right. Really thick, uh, grading fineward's, grading upwards uh, sediments. And then we go into this BD formation, which is the carbonates here. So that blue stuff's the carbonates, yeah. That's this yeah. blue st stuff in here, yeah. And then on top of that, we got this uh, tillite horizon. Right. So we're getting, a, we're getting a story of a, a basin being formed, yeah. the sort of the, the, the sediments eroding and coming into that basin, filling it up. Yeah. And we've also got this classic kind of snowball earth timeline thing. So we know yeah. exactly what sort of time in Earth's history we're at. Yeah. Yeah. And so, right. we, so in, in this, this particular Wilson cycle, this Caledonian mountain building event, mm -hmm. this is the first evidence of that rifting, that first phase of the, of the cycle. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Mm. Cool. Let's pack up the... After yeah. the sediments, rifting and extension continues to the point where we can even bring the Earth's mantle to the surface. We head deeper into the mountains to find evidence of this in what is known as hyperextension. Hyperextension is when during rifting the crust gets so much thinned that the mantle gets exhumed to the surface of the Earth. When the mantle gets exhumed to the surface, sediments can be deposited right on top of it. So what we are looking for is a primary contact 
uh, where sediments of a certain age, ideally of the rifting age, are deposited right on top of the mantle. And the mantle also sheds sediments that are of different composition to the sediments that are deposited in the ocean. So when we find a mix of these sediments, we know this mantle has been exposed at the seafloor, so it can, uh, so it, and continental crust was removed. So yesterday we, we started in the basement over here near Lake Mursa and we looked at the Baltica basement briefly here. And then we looked at the evidence for the rifting and the proximal part of the rift uh, here in, uh, in the road going all the way up through Gudbrandsdalen. We made several stops looking at these deep basins that filled up. And eventually we came and we saw that there were still continentally derived conglomerates far into this uh, area here. And the object of the exercise today is to continue out on the margin to see what is the evidence for hyperextension in this uh, part of the... <coughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> you want to find out about the geology? Yeah. Yeah. We can tell you yeah. about the geology. Yeah. Okay, a little, uh, a little distraction there. So, so now we will be looking for the evidence for the hyperextension, where we have mantle exhumed and we have a transitional crust. And in the regional picture now, you see, if you look to the west over there, the hills there, you look on to the western ice region, the basement of the western ice region here, which is part of Baltica basement. On top of that, and the rocks we are standing in now are the uh, are the hyperextended basin rocks that uh, we will be looking at shortly. And then to the east of us here, we can see the Jotunap, which is separated from the western ice region by this hyperextended basin underneath it. That makes the Jotunap a continental sliver, or perhaps even a microcontinent prior to the Caledonian collision. To get to these special outcrops, we head off up into the mountain. We're looking for a rock type called peridotite, an olivine-rich rock that represents parts of the earth mantle. Johannes and Torgier have been walking and mapping out the rocks in this area as evidence of the hyperextension phase of the Wilson cycle. Now we're standing at uh, the margin of this really big uh, peridotite. This might be a small isolated body from that main peridotite, but, uh, but it, on this surface that we are looking at here now, you can see that the center part of the surface where, where you are holding and, and a little bit further to the left is almost intact. It has a few, a few cracks in it and the cracks are kind of zig zigzagging through the rock. It doesn't, doesn't make a, a systematic uh, set of cracks, but when you get to the place where you hold your hand mm. now, you can see that the cracks are starting to wrap around better preserved peridotites and they start to look like clasts uh, almost. And, and you see the same on the other side. And this is kind of a miniature image of what you see in these big peridotites here. They, 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 almost all of them have this uh, intense fracturing that becomes more and more uh, affected by fluid infiltration and, and serpentinization. So you start to get flow and a little bit of movement between, between the fragments. And, and, and the whole peridotite body start to look more and more like a sedimentary rock when you come to the margin of it. And, and eventually we will see that they actually make sediments. And we will see that later today, where there is absolutely no doubt that, that these things become sediments because they produce both sandstones and laminated sandstones and layered conglomerates and so on and so forth. During my PhD, we um, mapped a particular unit in the Scandinavian Caledonite and Southwest Norway. And we particularly looked for contact relationships of the serpentinite bodies with the surrounding mica schists. So we try to find the sediment mix of ultramafic mantle-derived sediments with oceanic or continental-derived sediments. We also try to find rift-related intrusives intruding into sediments and mantle, which we can use for dating. So now, Dougal, you have a contact just in front of you, don't you, huh? This, this 
sort of dark greeny grey rock. Yeah. And then it's red and, there. And my All left red. foot is on this uh, rusty surface uh, here. So we obviously have a major rock difference here between just along where you're pointing now. So, so down where you are standing now, that's structurally below this uh, red weather. So this rock. is underneath that. This is yeah. underneath, yeah. So it's obviously a contact here that is dipping uh, into the slope of the surface here. So we have peridotite rock on top of this grey rock. And if we, if we look in detail in this grey rock here, you, you will see that it, it's, a, it's a schist. Mm. It's a fine grain, relatively fine grain schist, quite uh, rich in, uh, in original carbon. So that would have been a mudstone or something? It's a originally. mudstone. It yeah. was a mudstone before the metamorphism transformed it to a, uh, to, to a schist. And, yeah. um, so now we, are, we have a fine grain, probably deep marine, uh, carbon rich um, sediment, sediment yeah. that has been overridden by this huge block here now that is uh, several hundred meters in, in length and maybe 100 meters thick or something like that. And this has overridden this... Uh, and this is the, mantle? This is, this is original mantle rock. Well. <laughs> so the original mantle must have, must have come to the, to the seafloor surface here and then somehow slid on top of, on top of the already deposited uh, deep marine sediments. And then the whole lot's been sort of metamorphosed a little bit. And then know? everything was metamorphosed yeah, yeah. during the Caledonian, Caledonian collision. And the temperature of the metamorphism from this particular rock here is, is about 520 degrees, so quite a high, high grade metamorphic, yeah, regional yeah. metamorphic temperature. And of course, the, the, the mantle rock, the serpentinite and, and, and original peridotite, was also affected by this yeah, high grade yeah. metamorphism. It's quite cool because the, the red the red blocks you can see them dotted around. They actually stand out yeah. quite nicely on, yeah. the, on the on the topography. Yeah, we have already seen one small one, and we had a discussion yeah. uh, over yeah. there. And, and now we are in a in a hundred meter or almost kilometer size block here. So it's not many it's days when you can go and visit the mantle, is it? No, no, it's not. <laughs> and. Cool. Uh, and uh, you can actually take a very good look at it if, yes, if yeah. you want to. Yes, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're now in this green unit, um, which is the uh, a meta sedimentary complex which hosts all these metapyrotide bodies. And it sits structurally below the Jotunep, and the Jotunep are all the big mountains in the, in the background over there. And when you see all the units, they dip below the Jotunep. And over there, we have the Western Nice region. So, uh, this is the structure lowest unit, the uh, Jotunep complex is the structure higher unit, up in the crust would be in this direction. So if we unstack uh, the nap stack, the Jotunep would need to go further outboard than the unit we are now in to be uh, end up on top of this unit. So during my PhD, I mapped this area in detail and uh, the cross section that I just described uh, is basically this where this is the Yotunep, and you see that all the units dip below the Yotunep. And that's uh, the gray unit is the Western Nice region, and all the colorful part except the orange that are meta sediments and little slivers of gneisses that all dip with about 30 to 40 degrees towards the Yotunep. And the peridotite body here in purple, they stick between these mica schist units um, as little oblate pancake-shaped lenses. These remnants of mantle peridotite have been deformed and metamorphosed and contain serpentinite units with some key structures preserved inside. You can really see the, uh, the red colour in the rocks now, can't yes, you? Yes, that's the weathering colour of the, of the serpentinites. So here we are on the top of one of the bigger serpentinite bodies in this unit. And these serpentinites, they stick in between different mica schist units. If you look over there, you can see these ridges. Yeah. And these are different mica schist units and they form these ridges because they all dip in that direction. And the, uh, the peridotite per bodies, they stick in between these mica schists. Yeah. And all these units dip below the Jotunab, which is over there. Mm -hmm. And the peridotites are extremely well exposed here. And you see this wonderful fractionation of the serpentinite bodies. And <coughs> if you look at it uh, and you make the map it out, 
you have different surfaces and you see that this is a flattening fabric. Yeah, yeah. And there's an intensification. It looks like there's lenses in here. Yes, when the serpentinite shears, it forms these losing shape blocks like this. Yeah. And uh, the flattening is in this direction. So you have this kind of a plane like this, which is parallel to the regional fabric and the dip of the units. On the, when you map it out, you see they flatten in this direction. So whatever the shape was of these bodies before, now they have these oblate pancake shaped and stick mm. in between this pair of mica schist It units. looks also like there's been some more brittle. So it looks like sometimes they're squashed ductilely and then there's some sort of fractures as well that are appearing. Yeah, so the, what happens is that you have an anastomosing net of shear planes and they connect and then they shear off cut little through, bits right. of, of the larger um, uh, losing shape blocks. And in the end, if you go to this fabric intensifies towards the margins, and in the end you have only sheared surfaces and you lose all these blocks. If we go into the center, we have larger and larger blocks of this losing shape. Mm. Uh, shape. Oh, fascinating. What's the biggest of these peridotite bodies you found? This one is about 500 meters long and 150 three, to 300 meters thick. There's one that's a little bit bigger and the biggest ones get two, three kilometers long. Oh, wow, but wow. most of the time they are small, hundreds yeah, of meters. Yeah, yeah. So this is an area photograph of the area. This is the little mountain we're sitting on. And little the, mountain. <laughs> <It's quite yeah. laughs> and uh, the white lines represent the, uh, the mica schist ridges that we can see in the back. And we can nicely see how they have to wrap around this peritide body. Right. This is a picture taken from just over there. And we're sitting right here. Ah, right, okay. And, uh, you can even see all the redness of the, yes. of the unit. Is that what these purple bits are? are they yes, so this, yeah. this and this is exactly the same image. This is right. every photograph is in the map. And the purple is the peridotite, whereas green is the mica schist. And the peridotite likes to weather in this red color and nothing likes to grow on it, so it's always Always exposed, uh, yeah. Bold. Well, they really do stand out. I mean, from a distance, you can actually see, you know, once you've got your eye in, you can say, oh, that's going to be peridotite, that's going to be the schist. Yes, that makes the mapping et cetera, really... Et cetera. Yeah, nice. yes. Oh, that's fantastic. And you've basically been able to get a nice 3D geological model of this. Yes, we flew the drone all over this place and we take pictures and can make a 3D model out of it so we can really see the structures in this about 80 meters cliff that we can otherwise not access. And it's amazing to think that that's just one big lump of mantle. Yes. <laughs> How did it get here? So this is the evidence that these uh, peridotite bodies, this is a tiny little one, but this one is a kilometer or so in size. Uh, they, they actually made their way during this hyperextension process all the way to the surface of the, of the ocean at the time of the, of the rifting. And, and, this, and, and then they produced sediments that started to move and get redeposited in this ocean basin. Hmm. So it's, a, it's, um, it's an example where the entire continental crust has been stretched off so that the, uh, the lithospheric mantle is coming to the surface of the, of the, of the so basin. So this is a bit of mantle? So this is a piece of the mantle. Uh, I use that term rather than a mantle piece. <laughs> okay. A really cool outcrop we saw at the end of the day was um, actually the, the, the peridotites themselves were becoming sediments. So you've not only exposed the mantle, you're breaking it up and you're redepositing it as sediments. But the sediments themselves were just made entirely of wasted away bits of peridotite. A really quite fascinating rock that had actually been cut with a saw so we could see a lovely bench of polished peridotite sediments. But again, it's all mantle derived, hyperextension, late phase one of the Wilson cycle. Look here, what oh, we wow. have here. We really have something quite spectacular. And, and what is this now? It's a, it's a, it's a cut surface of this uh, conglomerate, of course. So what on earth has cut this block of rock in the middle of nowhere? Yeah, that, I can actually explain that to you. That, uh, <laughs> because I read a report about, uh, from the Norwegian Geological Survey about uh, how this was done. It was an attempt here to make this uh, quite remarkable outcrop of conglomerates into decoration stones. 
So mm -hmm. in order to investigate whether that it was something that could be used for uh, and durable during for, uh, polishing and so on and so forth, they cut out this piece with a diamond saw, <laughs> wired, a wired diamond saw that, that they put oh, through right. this hole. You can see the hole there yeah, at the base yeah. of the of that, and then they pulled it through and got this big piece out and, and transported out most of the material that they sawed out. And so I mean, you can really see the texture, it's a remarkable texture. I mean, this yeah. one here, for example, it's got all these rings around it. What's that? Yeah, and the class, all these class are, are derived from mantle rocks. Okay. And, and everything is derived from mantle rocks, even the sandstone layers that we see here. And, we see, and we, when we look at the, many of the class has this concentric zonation here. You can see the core here has pale core. That's a little piece of the original rock, it uh, was a peridotite, okay. that became serpentinized. And so the green rock here is a serpentinite. And then the serpentinite was even further hydrated and carbonated and became a soapstone. So around so the, the pale talc rim, is it? There's a pale rim here, it's a soapstone full yeah. of talc. Wow. So, so this is kind of a miniature model of many of so um, soapstone deposits. That's what they do. They sit around peridotites that have been hydrated like, like this. And we see a lot of them in this outcrop, big and small. And it's so although it, this is a, a conglomerate, a sort of sedimentary conglomerate, it's entirely made up of material from these peridotites, from these mantle rocks. It's exactly right. There is nothing but uh, mantle about material here. Even, the, even these sandstones that you can see that, that uh, we have in between the organized layers of, uh, of uh, conglomerate, they are all made out of uh, detrital uh, serpentinite, det uh, detrital peridotites. Oh, wow. So it's a, it's, a, it's a totally monomictic type of sedimentary deposit. Monomict meaning that everything comes from the same source. Yeah, and in this case, it's man yeah. it's, and in this case, it's the mantle, mantle wow. type material. And, it certainly does look pretty. I can see why they, they would want it on your, on your kitchen surface. Yes. But, uh, it seems to be a long, a long way to come and cut a, cut a thing well, out of the rock. If they had been, if it was durable and it, uh, they could have got a pretty good price from, uh, for, for this uh, material. However, it's now 10, 15 years since they did this. So it probably wasn't so, so good. So it's uh, probably not, uh, it's probably sub-economic sub actually. Mm, mm. Otherwise the landowner will probably have carried on with, with this in cooperation with some, some uh, professionals. So uh, no, it's a it's a totally unique. Um, so what place. is this rock actually then telling us about the, well, it's, this part of the system? It's telling us that in this basin that these uh, sediments were deposited, there was areas with a with a, with a, uh, mantle peridotites, serpentinized mantle peridotites exposed. So they were they were eroded, transported with currents, and were sorted and organized during this uh, sedimentary transport. So it's probably some kind of island situation mm, mm. Uh, where these uh, serpentine protrusions may have reached uh, even sea level or close, sub area yeah. exposed and, and then been eroded and and, 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 and redeposited. So, it's so again, a, it's further evidence for this whole thing being really, really extended. Uh, yeah, there, really, was not, really there was no continental crust material available when these were deposited. They were isolated, uh, completely isolated thing, Noth nothing uh, from the surrounding continents, uh, sediments from this, did not reach this, uh, this, this basin place, yeah. here. So it's, um, theref therefore it is, totally made up of the of mantle, original mantle material. We can also see that there is a lot of um, fluids have gone through these rocks. We see these veins and we see these uh, pale areas in between the clasts, yes. Mm. They, are, they are, are carbonated areas. So, they, so this, uh, this rock has also sequ sequestered CO2. Oh, right. So, uh, so there is CO2 sequestration in, in these rocks. So, mm. it, it, it is an interesting aspect well, in these It's a fascinating rock, so isn't it, really? It, it's got yes, so many it things is. to tell. So, um, so it's, a, it's a particularly fascinating um, outcrop and rock type. 
And it's a big so, one. So how much did you pay them to cut it open for you? I paid uh, nothing. <laughs> I, I, have, I, I, have a, I have no economic interest in this whatsoever, except, except that it pays my salary. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Field trips like these are fantastic because you get a perspective of the whole Wilson cycle, specifically in the Scandinavian Calidonite, where you have parts of every phase preserved. And it's particularly interesting getting out of your own little window that you always look at and get a bigger perspective of the whole organic cycle. So it's in this early rifting phase of the Wilson cycle that we create these sedimentary basins and collect the sediments and then we rift even further and we hyperextend and really thin the crust to the point where we actually bring the mantle to the surface. And in the next phase, we're going to do one thing more. We're going to create an ocean. <laughs>